Elon says Starship Test Flight 10 is expected to launch in about three weeks. This news is both exciting and a bit nerve-wracking. The big question on everyone's mind is, have they fixed the COPV issue that destroyed Ship 36? Well, the hint for that might lie in a place outside Starbase. On July 6th, something unexpected happened at SpaceX's McGregor test site in Texas, the same location where they are currently building Raptor 3 engines for the next generation Starship. A nearby camera captured the moment, a sudden blast, a plume of white vapor shooting at least 30 meters into the air, and what appeared to be a dark object launched skyward. People quickly speculated that this could have been a COPV test, possibly designed to simulate the kind of failure that occurred during the Ship 36 incident. To understand what SpaceX did, we need to answer two questions. What are COPVs, and what happened to them in the Ship 36 explosion? In rockets, a COPV, or composite overwrapped pressure vessel, is a lightweight, high-pressure tank used to store nitrogen gas. This gas is typically used to pressurize propellant tanks and can also power pneumatic systems. COPVs are built with a metallic liner wrapped in a strong lightweight composite material designed to withstand high internal pressures. There are several known failure modes for COPVs. These include overpressurization leading to sudden rupture, fatigue failure of the metallic liner, damage-induced bursting from either the liner or the composite structure, and stress rupture of the composite overwrap. Based on Elon Musk's comments, preliminary data suggests that a nitrogen COPV in the payload bay failed below its proof pressure. This behavior is somewhat consistent with stress rupture, a failure mode that can occur even when the vessel is exposed to pressures below its ultimate strength, as long as those stresses persist over time. Unfortunately, this kind of failure is particularly difficult to deal with. It's not well understood, hard to model, and extremely challenging to detect in advance. Damage typically begins in a small localized area that may appear at random and cannot be reliably identified with current inspection techniques before the vessel fails. Factors such as the level and duration of pressure, as well as the operating temperature, all contribute to the gradual degradation of the composite fibers and the bond between the fibers and the surrounding matrix. Over time, the accumulation of fiber breaks further, increases the likelihood of a stress rupture. Currently, there is no simple method for determining the stress rupture life of a KOPV, nor is there a screening technique to reliably tell whether a particular COPV is close to failure. The most substantial source of data concerning stress rupture in composite overwrapped pressure vessels came from a large test program conducted at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. This program involved testing over 100 Kevlar-wrapped vessels to understand how and when they fail under long-term stress. However, the testing conditions during the program were relatively uncontrolled, with considerable variation across the tests. As a result, the data collected lacked the consistency necessary for drawing firm conclusions about stress rupture behavior. Despite these limitations, NASA experts conducted a thorough review of all available data from the LLNL program and used it to develop a predictive stress rupture reliability model. This model estimates how likely a COPV is to survive over time without failure. Here's how it works. The model calculates reliability based on specific characteristics of each individual vessel. It considers factors such as how long the vessel has already operated at full pressure, and how long it is expected to remain under pressure in the future. One key metric is the stress ratio, which is calculated by dividing the stress in the vessel's outer Kevlar layer at its expected maximum pressure by the stress that would cause it to burst. Since each vessel is slightly different due to variations in manufacturing, materials, and operational history, each one has a unique stress ratio. These differences lead to variations in predicted reliability. To account for these differences and ensure conservative predictions, engineers created stress ratio curves using data from real COPVs. This included tests on older vessels and health checks on spare units. However, because the reliability model was primarily based on test units rather than actual flight hardware, and because no stress rupture testing had been done on the COPI used in space, the team decided to run a real test. The goal was to compare actual performance with the model's predictions. 
Although differences between test and flight hardware made this comparison somewhat challenging, even testing a single flight COPV could yield valuable insights. The stress rupture test was performed at maximum operating pressure and an elevated temperature to accelerate aging. The test was conducted in four phases. The first phase, at 130 degrees Fahrenheit, was a moderately accelerated test designed to reach the midpoint of the model's predicted point reliability. The second phase, at 160 degrees Fahrenheit, was more aggressive and aimed to determine whether the test article would exceed the 95% confidence interval of the model. In phase three, the vessel's pressure was increased to above its maximum operating level while maintaining the same temperature as phase two. Once the vessel accumulated enough effective hours to reach the 99.99% confidence level of the model, phase four began. In this final phase, the temperature was raised to over 170 degrees Fahrenheit. The vessel was held at phase four conditions until it ultimately failed. SpaceX could conduct a similar test by subjecting Starship's COPV to maximum operating pressure and elevated temperature until it fails. The key difference is that SpaceX has more direct access to the hardware and may not need to develop a predictive stress rupture reliability model in the same way NASA did. A long-term solution might involve SpaceX developing its own co-PV design. For now, Starship is using off-the-shelf components to accelerate development and gather real-world data, even if some of these parts eventually prove inadequate for long-term use. Co-PVs are not like tank rings. Tank rings are often scrapped or modified due to manufacturing defects or changing design requirements. Co-PVs, on the other hand, are far more complex, sensitive, and difficult to produce. This makes repeated redesigns and replacements significantly more costly and risky. So the current approach makes sense during rapid prototyping. However, once the Starship KOPV design is verified, it would be wise for SpaceX to shift to in-house production. A good precedent comes from the Falcon 9 program. After a failure, the CoPVs used on Falcon 9 were completely redesigned. The updated version featured improved liners, enhanced insulation, and revised helium loading procedures to address issues such as buckling and liquid oxygen pooling around the vessels. At the time, Elon Musk described the redesigned COPVs as the most advanced pressure vessels ever developed and he personally reviewed the new design alongside SpaceX's top engineers. These vessels underwent extensive testing and validation, including oversight from NASA. The new design included a burst pressure rating more than twice the maximum pressure experienced during normal operations, offering a substantial safety margin. The burst pressure rating refers to the maximum pressure a vessel can withstand before catastrophic failure. Since their introduction in late 2018, the redesigned COPVs have flown reliably aboard Falcon 9 Block 5 in over five years and hundreds of launches, including static fires and all mission phases. There have been no reported COPV failures. Nevertheless, SpaceX must be testing ship 37's COPVs throughout this time to ensure that no issues can occur. Complete reliability is critical. That's because this time is different. The ship will conduct its static fire test on a modified test stand at launch pad A. If the ship were to explode there, we wouldn't just lose another test article. We could also lose the ability to launch any Block 2 ship from that site. Let's hope that doesn't happen. Right now, work at pad A is still going strong. A square hole has been cut into the lower section of the booster q d to allow for a new connection. New propellant lines and support structures are being installed to connect with a modified ship, QD, which will be used to fuel ships during static fire testing. At the same time, heavy steel plates are being welded around the edges of the modified ship transport stand. This is, of course, to help it withstand the extreme flame force from the ship's Raptor engines during static fire tests. The first static fire test at this stand will be very interesting to watch. If you're looking forward to it too, drop a Let's Go Ship 37 in the comments. Also, don't forget to subscribe. We're almost at the 10,000 subscriber mark. Thank you. Starship Flight Test 10 will be an integrated Starship test flight, likely suborbital, due to the failure of Flight 9. The exact flight profile is still unknown, but it will likely include several re-entry experiments 
and the deployment of Starlink simulators, similar to what Flight 9 was intended to do. So, in addition to fixing the CoPV issue, SpaceX also needs to ensure that the errors from the previous flight do not happen again. One of those issues was a leak that caused a loss of main tank pressure during the coast and re-entry phases. This leak prevented the ship's attitude control system from functioning properly. To address this, it's highly likely that SpaceX will add a redundant reaction control system. Unlike the current system, which relies on main tank pressure, the new system would operate independently. This means that even if a leak occurs, the ship would still be able to steer, adjust its orientation, or make small directional changes to avoid uncontrolled spinning. SpaceX could also improve the flight algorithms and increase control authority, allowing Starship to reorient itself using only aerodynamic surfaces if it loses attitude control and begins re-entry in an unexpected orientation. Essentially, if Starship starts behaving unpredictably, like an out-of-control aircraft, it could still interact with the atmosphere and use forces such as lift and drag to stabilize itself. The flaps could then generate the control forces needed to bring it back into a proper re-entry attitude. Starship also needs to fix the payload door, which got stuck during Flight 9. For now, though, it's not as critical and should be an easier fix. It might take a few attempts to get reliable data from it, but it's not the kind of issue that would lead to the loss of the entire vehicle. There are only two Block 2 Starships left to fly before the transition to the next version begins, so I really hope this flight goes well. It could generate a lot of valuable data to help fine-tune Block 3, which has many major milestones ahead to tackle. And honestly, I just don't want Starship Version 2 to go down in history as the cursed version of Starship.